Hello everyone. My name is Josh Maurer. I'm instructor at Broken Plow Western Martial Arts. I usually teach longsword on Wednesday nights, but today we're going to talk about sword and buckler. Sword and buckler happens to be my most favorite weapon set, even though it's not the one I usually teach. But hopefully this will get you guys interested in it. So when I'm talking about sword and buckler, what are the weapons? Number one, sword is an arming sword. Usually a straight sword, double-edged, one-handed. Um, sometimes in the uh, material you'll read in the past, some people use a messer, but canonically, it's an arming sword. Uh, the actual type of arming sword we're going to be using, because we're just following the text from MS-133, or the Valpurgis Effect book, is the Type 14 arming sword. And the buckler, which is your shield. It's a smaller shield. Uh, basically, it's just the bowl with a little bit of extra add-on around the outside. Um, this one's actually probably slightly larger than most bucklers would have been, but not much. Uh, the reason why people would carry around something like this size, this isn't for the battlefield, right? This isn't a kite shield. And if you're a bodyguard around town or if you're just trying to carry stuff around because uh, you're a mercenary and you are looking for work to protect people and you want to have your stuff on you, if you want a shield, this is the one you would carry because you just carry this on your hip over here. You carry your sword over here in its scabbard. And then if you need them, you can pull them out. And by the way, this is very easy to take into bars and shops. Kite shield, not so much. In fact, uh, bucklers were used around town so often, there were schools that taught sword buckler. And schools would challenge each other, like you would see in some of those kung fu movies. And when they go around challenging each other, they would swash their buckler. Hence how we get the term swashbuckler, because swash means to strike, and they're striking with their swords on their buckler to challenge. That's how we get that term and that type of person. Now, we're going to be studying sword and buckler from MS-133, the Welder Pergus Effect Book, which is the earliest known surviving uh, fight combat manual in existence from medieval Europe. Um, anything older than that is stuff we kind of have to interpret. <laughs> Sometimes it's stuff we interpret from pottery, but this is the actual oldest manual that we have from Europe. Uh, one of the oldest fighting um, manuals in the world surviving today. And it goes over sword and buckler. And it's written by um, monks, and they're the ones that actually taught this style to lay people, the people that would pay for it. Um, now, we first have to talk about how do I hold my sword and buckler, what are the different guards, and how do I strike before we can get into any of the other cool stuff. In fact, we might not get into all the other cool stuff that the book really talks about, all the techniques. We need to first acclimate ourselves, what is sword and buckler, how do we do it? So, first thing, how do I hold my shield? Well, usually depending on what kind of buckler you have, you either have one that goes flush with the bowl, or you have one that I have, is what we call a garage door handle, because it's basically what it is. What you do is you actually put your thumb up along the handle. This gives you better control with the shield to move it around. This is less dexterous. This one has a bit more stability and structure behind it. Just don't break your thumb. And obviously with the sword, we're gonna hold it like you guys know how to hold it. Handshake grip, right? Not a hammer grip, but a handshake grip. The reason why is because these swords actually give you room to do that. With Viking swords and swords that uh, the knightly swords that come right after the Viking sword, there wasn't a lot of room between the pommel and the handle to get a handshake grip. So they eventually made it long enough because they had better materials that you could actually get your hand in this position. Now I can get better reach, I have better structure, and I can cut better. Now let's talk about the guards. And the guards are mostly numbered. Some of them are not. Some of them have actual names. But let's go over the number ones first. So, number one is this underneath. So, this looks like 
because my buckler is shielding you from telling you what my hands are really doing. My sword hand is underneath my shield arm with the long edge facing up. And I'm covering that side with my shield so as to prevent them from attacking me. It also is a good way to not be able to see what I'm doing. And what I would then go to for the next guard, sorry, I forgot to show what my feet were doing. Dominant foot forward. Non-dominant back. Next, we're going to go over number two. So from number one, we're going to flow to number two. Number two looks a lot like Von Tok, right? The only difference is that I have the shield up, out, in front of me, cutting off the angle. But not cutting off my vision to be able to see where I'm striking, right? I still see what I'm striking at, but I'm taking away the angle at which the other person can attack me. And with that, the dominant foot is back, non-dominant forward. Now we'll move on to guard number three. Guard number three. This is with your non-dominant, this is like bum tog on the non-dominant side. Okay. same position as it was before. Okay. And of course I switched my feet, my dominant foot is full. Now we'll move on to number four, which if I remember correctly, is uh, this one. This is high von Tag, right? You have your dominant foot back, you still have that shield out in front of you, but now your arms, your hands up here. This is more the same as number two. The only difference is that you have a bit more of an intimidating uh, guard look. Someone doesn't really want to come at, in at you, or you're at least making them think about getting hit from above. And then from number four, we'll go to number five. Number five, with the sword behind us, tailing behind us, so that the other person can't see it. Okay? So from here, it's out back behind us. Okay. Now, we're going to move on to number six, which is just here, okay? We have our so either right on the side or even right behind it so that they can't see it, but it's right behind our buckler. Usually, I keep right behind the buckler, but sometimes I'll put it out here because when I go to stab, The rim of the buckler actually makes sure that my point is pointed on target, just because of the way the, sh the rim is shaped. And then from number six, we have the last one, which is not numbered, but it's long one, long point, right? And if one thing that you'll notice from uh, 133, very early on, it talks about the fact that you will always pass through long point with every single cut that you make from any of the guards. You're going to pass through long point. Okay? So keep that in mind. This guard is incredibly important. Okay? Now, there are some other guards that are pretty common that you will probably find very useful. So this is half shield or half shield. Basically all it is, I'm going to keep my point up. It's not going to be pointed at the person, but it's going to be pointed up. This is a very defensive posture. I'm going to leave no gap between my sword and my shield. And of course I'm going to have my shield on whatever side that they're threatening with. So if they have the sword over here on me, I'm going to be in this hump shot. But if your sword's over here, 
actually going to bring my hand underneath and cup around my sword hand. This is actually going to help me for anything that I do next. Because once I strike here and parry, I can then move on to the next step a lot easier. So, pop shield here, pop shield here. Um, another guard that's very commonly used, I use it in place of using number two, mainly because number two gets really, really tiring if you hold it out there forever, right? You have to really train this for a long time to get this to stay out there. And if you're carrying a, an actual steel buckler and not one of the cold steel plastic ones, this can get tiring. But this modified number two in a way is called the Walpurgis guard. Basically, it's a boxer stance, okay? Hands are in a boxing position but from here, I can do what I need to do. And if someone tries to come in to strike at me, I don't have to move much in order to defend myself. And we'll show that soon. But first, those are the guards for the most part. There are some other types of things that you can do with the sword and the buckler. But for right now, we're going to talk about those guards for now. So. Now let's talk about how do we step, right? So let's say we're in our number two, well, actually for me because I'll be holding this for a while. We're in our little Purgus farm guard. How do we step? So, diagonal. Every single step is diagonal. And because the reason is the other person has a shield, right? This isn't like long sword where you may still hit the person going straight in. They have a shield up guarding the angle straight on. It's forcing you to have to move around them to get at them. So you have to move around them to get at them. Otherwise, it's a futile effort. So, diagonal forward, diagonal backward. Imagine a square around you, and you're in the center, and each step you're trying to hit the corners of the square. All right? That's how you need to step when you step with sword and buckler. That allows you to get around the shield. Now, how do we strike? Anytime you're striking, whether you're parrying, or you're actually striking at the person, the sword and the buckler are always moving together. at the same time, always. So simply, let's start out with cutting from number two, just cutting a normal over how to long. Okay. Shield was out here. And as I'm striking, I'm covering my hand as I'm cutting. That way I don't get hit as I'm striking. I'm coming in, I need to cut off the angle. I need to make sure that they can't hit me in the head or the hands or whatever. So I need to cover myself when I'm going in. And that's the same case for anything. Let's say I'm in this number five and I want to come with like this short edge strike around. Okay. Here, and I'm striking out. Always, always stepping offline and always covering myself. Now let's talk about when we're in three, right? We're in three, it's a little bit different. See how my hand is cupped around my uh, sword arm? Just like when we were, I showed you hop shield on that non-dominant side. That's kind of how we have to cut when we're cutting from that side. We either have to cut like this, or we have to cut and cover around it. I like cupping just because um, I don't have to move as much when I do it. 
but if you want to cut and cover, that's one thing you can do. It's just not terribly easy. Show it again. Um, when you're cutting from number one, right? Number one again, shields out here, and I'm underneath my arm. And cut up. And cover. Okay. It's not going to be a low cut like this. It can be, more than likely. It's going to be this cut. Uh, but you're starting to get the general idea. Let's talk about number six. So I'm hiding my point behind my shield. Gonna strike and cover at the same time. Now let's talk about what we were talking about with Walpurgis guard. So we're here in this boxing stance, right? I don't have to move much to cover myself. So if he strikes high, I'm gonna cover above myself just enough that I need to. I'm just basically rotating around my head and I'm cutting low. Okay. Now, let's say that they're cutting from below. Right? Same type of thing. I'm moving my buckler and my sword at the same time. Let's say they're cutting into my shield. Right? still going to defend and cut at the same time. I'm not going to defend, then cut. That gives them too much time. I have two things that can do things independently at the same time. So why not take advantage of that? So, that's kind of the basics on how to strike, how to parry, how to move, and the guards for sword and buckler. So what you need to do is practice holding the guards, stepping while holding the guards, stepping and cutting offline and covering with every strike, and practice, even if you're doing it from number two, right, you can still do it. But you need to get used to the fact that you need to strike and defend at the same time with every strike. So that's going to be Sword and Buckler for today. We'll get into it a little bit more a little later. Thank you guys for listening. My name is Josh Maurer. I'm an instructor at Brooklyn Plow with some martial arts.